Kia ora and welcome to this short video on adaptations. Today we're going to cover a few things, mainly the three main types of adaptations and plenty of examples about these in actual nature itself. But first, what is the meaning of life for an animal? Well, every single living thing wants to do two things. Can you have a think about what those two things are? Right, they want to survive and they want to reproduce. All an animal's adaptations will be geared towards one of these two things, something that will make it survive more and something that will make it um, be able to pass on its genetic material to further generations. And that is what defines success. So what are adaptations? Well, they're these things that are inherited um, characteristics that help an organism to survive long enough to reproduce more successfully in its changing environment. That's really important, the changing environment, and can either be structural or behavioral or physiological. So here you can see a hummingbird. It's got a number of adaptations, one of them being its beak, one of them being its ability to fly and hover. And here, birds are a great example, particularly in New Zealand, due to their ex extensive diversity. So, adaptations. Have a look at here and listen to those three key words I gave you before. Physiological, structural, and behavioral. What do those three words mean? Every living thing on Earth is perfectly adapted to survive in its natural environment. They have the features that help them to survive to be successful, and these are those adaptations that we're talking about. If an environment changes, only the strongest will survive, and it's the changing in environments that is also extremely key to adaptations and passing on your genetic material. So I use this word inherited characteristics. Well, you'll often see that you are part of your mum, part of your dad. You inherited some of their traits. And when we go into more genetics later on in your schooling, this will become um, a lot more clearer. But today, I just want to cover a few things. So, how many, uh, ask yourselves these questions. They all have something to do with adaptations. And if you could work out <clears throat> why tigers have their stripes and why giraffes have such a long neck then you're doing pretty well okay now we're going into the main types of adaptations the first one is we have these things called structural adaptations and they're the sort of physical makeup of an organism and basically how it is built so these are often things you will see and are the most notice noticeable um, adaptations the next one we have are these physiological adaptations, um, often um, called functional adaptations as well. And this is how an organism works internally, in response to the environment or in response to another organism. And finally, we have behavioral. And this is what the organism does. And these can be inherited um, innate traits or um, instincts, and they can also be learned behaviors. So, here's some cool animals. All of these exhibit at least one of those three types of adaptations that you may know of. We're going to unpack each of these now. So, structural, the, the polar bear. Really cool example about what we can see in terms of each of the types of um, adaptations. Structurally, you can see the bears are pretty big, but they've got these really well-designed pads of pores that are covered with small, soft papillae or dermal bumps, which provide traction on the ice. They also have a really thick layer of blubber or fat that keeps the polar bear warm when it's swimming. Pretty good adaptation to have when you're swimming in the Arctic Circle. Its physiological adaptations, or its functional adaptations, is that it has this really well-developed sense of smell. 
It can detect a seal from 1.6 kilometers away and one that is buried about a you know, meter underneath the snow. It's also got extremely good long distance vision. And finally, you might have heard this one before, but its behavioral adaptation is that it can burrow or dig dens several meters down to obtain shelter from high winds that sweep over the ice as it moves slowly to prevent overheating and it risks often. So some behavioral traits that it has picked up there. Here's some really cool structural adaptations that you can see. And the definition of a structural adaptation is an actual body part or parts or a, a coloration that helps an organism survive in their environment. So why do tigers have stripes? We've got camouflage. We've got things like mimicry, bent hind legs, sharp teeth and claws, and body structures. So we're just going to have a look at a few of those now. Camouflage is one of the coolest and most well-known. Um, see if you can spot all the organisms in these pictures. Some are more obvious than others. Um, this one particularly, there's the owl there. Camouflage does two things. It either helps you um, be protected from predators trying to find you, or it helps you hunt prey. It's being seen at the last minute. So it's two really um, good uh, reasons for having camouflage. Blends in with the environment. It's for protection from predators, or it helps you sneak up on them. So it's about obtaining food or protection. Here's some really uh, some more cool um, versions of camouflage. This one's an interesting one, and we'll cover it a bit soon. Um, but can you see the? Uh, the I think that was actually an um, octopus. It doesn't look like one. Many people think it's a flounder. There's a praying mantis there. It's pretty cool. All right, moving on. Um, here we have what's called mimicry. Now, this is copying a behavior or appearance of something else. And this, again, is used for protection or obtaining food. So here we have um, an owl and a moth. And this moth has developed a pattern on its back that looks like the owl. So when the owl sees the moth um, landing on a tree, it doesn't think it's prey, it thinks it's another owl. That's fascinating. How did a moth get to look exactly like another organism? And that's all about this inheritance and the passing of genetic material and natural selection. We won't go into that today, but it is a fascinating topic. We've got a caterpillar that has decided it wants to look like a snake. And this particular snake is a poisonous one, so most things won't go near it. Same with our monarch butterflies that we get here in New Zealand. A monarch butterfly is poisonous, but there's an also another one called the viceroy that isn't. And a bird can't tell the difference, so will opt not to go for the poisonous one, thinking um, it's a monarch, but it's actually a viceroy. And we've all seen the good old stick insect. Um, you know, some of them are designed to look more like leaves, but um, again, forms of mimicry. Fascinating. In this one, we've got them as well. We're talking about teeth. Pretty self-explanatory. You know, predators, canines, have large front teeth. Um, herbivores have these flat grinding teeth. And chimps actually have what we used to have um, millions of years ago. Uh, but we um, have developed the, uh, not needing these giant canines. Sometimes having large teeth is not actually practical, but it's also... Um, a dominance display, males will often have bigger appendages, including teeth, to um, woo the ladies. Here we're going to talk about eyes. Now, eyes are fascinating. Um, when we're talking about prey or things that get hunted, they will often have their eyes on the sides of their heads. And that allows them to have a lot greater vision either side of their bodies or down their bodies. So they can see a much greater place uh, vision around their bodies, which allows them to see predators early and therefore get a leg, uh, get a, um, a head start against them. And then obviously we have the opposite, which are our predators, which will always have their eyes like us at the front of their bodies. And that's so that they can see prey, but also when they're hunting, they need to be able to judge distances, jump um, and uh, hunt. So you find um, tree dwelling organisms often have their eyes at the front of their bodies as well 
um, when they're swinging through trees. Having your eyes here allows much greater depth perception for you to grab things. That's a pretty good one. All right, moving on to behavioral adaptations now. You can see we've got a few cool examples here. But the definition of a behavioral adaptation is the ways an organisms act to help them survive in their environment or to get a mate. So here you can see three examples. We've got the old sleepy bear and hibernation is that adaptation. We've got the geese flying um, south for the winter to better climates. And then we have birds are a fantastic example. And you only have to look at the birds of paradise to see the amount of adaptations they have in terms of dances and displays to woo the ladies. So they're pretty cool as well. Um, here's some others that you might uh, might know about. You know, you've got your, your classic bird sitting on an egg to keep it warm. All right, you've got gophers popping up and down um, from the ground. Meerkats do this as well to keep a lookout. Um, and you've got beavers making dams. So all these things are, are um, behavioral adaptations um, that allow them to survive. And in simple animals, behavior is governed by this thing called instinct, meaning that it is pre-programmed into your genes if more complex animals, its instinctive behavior is often modified by learning, okay, producing a more flexible response to the outside world. So when my daughter was born, she had um, the ability to grip things when uh, certain things touched um, parts of her hands and her feet. She would you know, curl her toes and grip her hands, um, and she would also know to try and seek um, a feed from mum pretty quickly. Um, which was an amazing sort of behavioural instinct of a young child that has had literally seconds out from um, the womb into the real world, and she's finding um, the ability to feed and grab on to mum, which is a um, phenomenal instinctual behaviour. And we've got the uh, one quite specific to New Zealand when we see the orcas in the harbour. Um, we've got that sort of migratory patterns of birds and of whales and sea life um, to better climates, to better places to give birth, um, to better places to find food. So lots of reasons things migrate. Um, you know, you hear of the seasonal or periodic movement of animals in response to changes in climate or food availability, um, and particularly, you know, the, when the humpbacks go to the tropics to raise their young. Uh, it commonly inv involves movement from one area to another, um, and even our monarch butterflies go for a bit of a a trek across the world to um, reproduce. Here we've got the uh, classic example that we all know of when we think of bears called hibernation and this is just an adaptation which they've learned to do to survive winter. Um, it's when your body, uh, it's a technique where the animal becomes inactive and where it gets all its met metabolic processes, the things that um, produce energy and use up energy, to slow right down. In cold weather, most animals um, must eat these large, large amounts of food, which I know you lads um, won't mind doing, uh, to get enough energy to survive um, over that long period of time. And they don't sleep for the entire time, um, which you know commonly people think. They just reduce the amount of activity they have. So you know they don't just go into a cave and don't come out for weeks on end. Um, they'll just sleep, slow down everything, you know, maybe go for a, a little wander, but then come back in because they've built up um, the reserves of their food. This is another really common um, behavioral adaptation, <coughs> and um, most animals are social things, and they like to live in groups. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. You know, safety in numbers, you've heard that before. With more people in the group, you've got more eyes in the group to watch out for prey. You've got more success if you're hunting in a pack. Um, and you've got a better protective network when you're in a group. So you think of fish swimming in a school or a shoal, depending on how you pronounce it. <clears throat> their dazzling displays, their scales um, confuse predators, um, and it's very hard to pinpoint what you're trying to hunt in a big mass cloud of fish. Same with you know the zebras and their stripes, and you actually see the combination of a structural adaptation and the um, stripes, the the, uh, the sorry the structural adaptation of the stripes and the behavioural adaptation of the um, herd behaviour to really confuse when the lions try to hunt. So you can often see um, adaptations interlinking and overlapping.
Here, um, we have quite an interesting one, and that is um, tool use. So, you know, when um, an animal has learned to use another object um, from its environment in order to manipulate or perform a specific task. So we often see, um, you know, the chimpanzees doing this um, with termite mounds. We've got a bird here that knows to use a stick to get a grub out. Um, otters break open clams with rocks. We put a rock on the chest to clam and smash it. And the same with monkeys and their nuts. So um, it's quite amazing that these things have learned those behaviours. And another really cool one is just playing dead. You know, you've heard playing possum, playing dead. Um, so possums have this ability to realise that Sometimes, if they look dead, animals won't touch them if they're not a scavenger. So that's quite um, a cool little adaptation there. Um, and finally, I think for the um, behavioral adaptations, we've got uh, sort of calling behaviors. And you see this in wolves, um, you know, hearing that sort of eerie but beautiful um, piercing of the Alaskan wilderness or the Siberian wastes. You hear the... Um, the call of the wolf and that is communication so to not only communicate between the pack but also to rival packs and we've got dominance displays that are threatening gestures you know puffer fish ex expanding that's a structural adaptation but also a behavior because it's done when threatened um, to scare off potential predators cool and lastly, <clears throat> the physiological adaptation. Now, these are the hardest to try and work out because unless you sort of know the inner workings of an organism, it can be quite tough. Um, so here's a few examples, and I'll go over these. But the definition of a physiological adaptation is that they are the internal systems or processes in an animal's body that respond to the physical threats of uh, to an animal from the environment or its predators. So here's some examples I've got here. You've got the stereotypical one that's always used in an example is the chemical um, parts of um, animals. So things like venomous bites or stings. So you're thinking bees, you're thinking spiders, you're thinking snakes. They use venom or poison <coughs> to um, hunt their prey or to defend themselves. Okay, you've also got cool things like um, dart frogs and pufferfish. They produce that poison. The um, snakes, bees, and spiders produce venom. That's the difference. And the ability to change colors is actually a chemical response. And, and we saw some pictures of a chameleon earlier in the um, presentation. And the next one is the um, sort of internal systems of an organism. So I'll direct your attention to our camel here. Now, we saw this a little bit with our um, polar bear as well. Sometimes an organism is specifically adapted to be able to survive extremely harsh um, environments. So a camel here has more efficient organs, particularly its kidneys. Their kidneys are responsible for filtering water. Now, you can see where that's going to be a good thing. And it also can store a lot of fat in its humps that allow it to survive long periods of time between finding a drink and a meal. So internal organs are another um, physiological adaptation. And finally, um, we haven't talked about the mosquito yet. This one actually is really cool. It excretes blood thinners. So when it bites you, it doesn't, um, your body's very good at clotting itself to stop um, you losing too much blood. It's, it's one of your um, physiological adaptations, you know, blood clotting. But you can't clot if there are certain factors there because, you know, we can't have our blood always clotting. Otherwise, we'd have heart attacks left, right, and center. So the a, um, mosquito, when it bites you, puts the blood thinners in there so you can't clot the whole clothes that it's drinking through and then it allows it to have a decent meal. So that's a fantastic and um, quite amazing uh, physiological adaptation there. So there we have it. Lots of cool adaptations, both structural, behavioral and physiological. Your, your um, task now is to maybe have a look at these ones that are up on the uh, video here and see what you think the key adaptations these organisms have. We haven't really talked too much about plants. There was a picture of a plant before with water gathering on its leaf, so it didn't <coughs> weigh the leaf down and, and um, sort of stop it from being able to photosynthesize the next day. So plants have heaps of adaptations um, as well, but that's going to be a video for another day. 
So I'll wrap it up here. You've been a great audience. Any questions that this video has brought up, please do not hesitate to get hold of me in class and give me those fantastic questions. Hope you learned heaps. Catch you later.